Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming to ApacheCon and specifically for coming to this talk, Analytics at 1000 QPS and Beyond. Uh, I'm Gian Merlino, and I'll be talking about how we do this with Apache Druid. So, okay, who am I? I'm Gian Merlino. I am a committer and I'm the PMC chair at Apache Druid. And I'm also co founder at Imply, a company that is all built around Apache Druid. What we'll talk about today first, a brief intro to Apache Druid. Uh, then I'll talk about the three levels of high load analytics. Uh, we're going to talk about level zero, one, two. And then we're talking about how to try this at home. So, first off, a brief intro to Apache Druid. What is it all about? Uh, we like to think of Druid as an engine, a rocket ship. It's a database that goes really fast. Uh, but what Druid really is, is it's a big calculator. Um, it's a big fancy calculator, uh, scales to thousands of servers, does analytical queries really, really quickly. Druid's purpose, uh, what it was originally created for, was to power analytical applications. Uh, I've got a screenshot here of an example. This is uh, Imply Pivot, a analytical application that we build at Imply. Um, and the thing that makes analytical applications uh, what they are is things must queries must respond very quickly. There's going to be interactivity uh, between the user and their data. Lots of pointing and clicking. Uh, lots of um, very rapid fire interactions. Think applications like Google Analytics. Um, so some people use Druid with Imply Pivot, the app that we make. Uh, many people make their own apps. Uh, Apache Druid speaks SQL, and you can build your own app on top of that. Druid's used at a lot of different places. Uh, so there's a, here's a, a bunch of articles that were written in the last few years about Druid use. Druid enables analytics at Airbnb. Netflix uses Druid for real-time insights, uh, ensuring a high-quality experience. Salesforce uses Druid for insights as well. Uh, and Mopub, a, a Twitter company, um, uses Druid to query terabytes of data in seconds. Some stats here in the top right of the slide uh, of what's happening in real Druid clusters. So real Druid clusters are doing 100 plus billion rows a day of ingestion, <clears throat> retaining over a trillion rows uh, over a year of data, hundreds of servers in a cluster. Uh, the largest clusters are actually over a thousand servers. And all this was sub-second to a few seconds of query latency and a mix of streaming and batch ingestion. So Druid is a database. Druid is a very scalable database, a very fast database. Uh, and for these kinds of applications, it is super, super important to be able to do large numbers of queries and at the same time uh, maintain that high query speed uh, and consistent query performance. And so I want to talk now a bit about how we do that and what uh, techniques we take in the software itself, in Druid itself, and also what techniques people that deploy Druid do um, on the deployment and configuration side in order to achieve what we're trying to achieve here. So um, for this talk, I want to talk about three different levels of, of how this can be done. And each of these levels uh, is, is kind of going out from the hardware into configuration. So the first uh, level zero, that's about CPO and IO, really here focusing on the software itself and the hardware. Um, level one, talking about scaling. So that's the next level up, talking about how you take uh, um, how you take uh, uh, the software and how you scale it out to a cluster in a reasonable way. And then level two, handling heterogeneous workloads. Level two is, is once things are scaled out, now you may have many different kinds of workloads uh, running on the same data, and how do you handle that? So we'll talk about each of these levels in turn. Each one has some techniques I want to highlight. The first one, level zero, uh, the most innermost level, CPU and I.O. So the goal here is to minimize the CPU and I.O. required to execute a query. This is all about local efficiency. These techniques apply equally to single servers or large clusters. The idea is if you had one server, you want to do as much as you can on that one server, be as efficient as possible. And if you have a thousand servers, the way to get good performance at that thousand server scale is to make sure each individual server is running as efficiently as possible. There's many techniques to achieve this, and I'll discuss some of them. But first off, why does this matter? Well, it matters because uh, efficiency at this level, at the level of CPU and I.O., at the hardware level, maximizes the number of queries that can run per unit of time for a given CPU and I.O. budget. And the idea here is that less resource use per query means we can do more queries. Uh, a good way to think about this is sort of like a bin packing problem. 
imagine you have 100 CPUs and each query takes 10 seconds of CPU time. Uh, if you make the most efficient use of these CPUs possible, you can run up to 10 queries per second. Because uh, uh, you know, 10 times 10 is 100. And so that means that if you want to scale beyond 10 queries per second, you're either going to need to add more CPUs or you're going to need to reduce the amount of CPU time each query takes. And that's what that efficiency is about. So I want to talk a bit about how we do that. The first thing I want to talk about is the software. The most fundamental aspect of Druid is that it's a column-oriented and segmented database. What I mean by that is every table is split up into segments. So if you have a table of a billion rows, that might be split up into 200 segments, for example. Uh, each segment tends to have a few million rows in it. And within each of those segments, we store data in a columnar fashion with indexes. So what you're seeing here in front of you is a schematic representation of one segment of data. So this segment has eight rows in it. You can tell because the data section of each column here, time, artist, city, price, and count, the data section of each column has eight elements in it. A real segment would have millions, but uh, we can't show them on one slide. So uh, an important thing here, the first thing to see here is that each of the columns is stored separately. This is important because uh, real queries tend not to use every column in a data set. They tend to use uh, maybe two or three, four or five columns out of a hundred row data set, for example. And that means that, that uh, storing the data separately, column by column, is very helpful because it minimizes the amount of I.O. we have to do. Uh, it, it means we do not need to read um, any of the columns off disk or even from memory to the CPU, uh, meaning we're saving on I.O. and saving on RAM to CPU bandwidth. Let's walk through an example of how we would do a query using this columnar data. So here in the uh, top left of the slide, we have an example SQL query we might run this data set. This is a uh, ticket sales data set. So let's say we want to see uh, total price of tickets sold grouped by city uh, where the artist equals the particular artist, Justin, in this example. So that's select city, sum of price from sales, this table, where artist equals Justin grouped by city. And I'm going to just focus on what happens on this individual segment. Of course, in a real table or in a real uh, uh, query, we'd be querying many segments and then merging the results of those different segments. But I'm just going to look at what happens at one segment for, uh, for this example. So the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to resolve the artist filter. So artist equals Justin. And we're actually not going to look at the data section of the artist column for this. We are going to look only at the dictionary and the index. Uh, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to look at the dictionary to see what the dictionary code is, the ID for Justin. In Druid, we uh, use a dictionary to assign an ID to every uh, value of a string column like this. So Justin has been assigned ID 0, which we will find out from the dictionary. Then we'll go to the index, uh, and we will see that um, ID 0 corresponds to this uh, rows 0, 1, and 2. The index has the same number of elements as the dictionary. It's a one-to-one -one there. The first index entry is for the first dictionary entry, and so on. So once uh, we've done this, we now know that rows 0, 1, and 2 are the ones that match this filter. And we did this without having to actually read data out of the artist column uh, using these indexes. Next, we're going to go to the city and price columns, uh, and we're going to walk the data sections together. So we are going to first look at, um, and we're only going to look at those first three rows. We're going to first look at city 2, price 1800, then city 1, price 2912, then city 2, and price 1953. We then group those together, and then finally use the dictionary of the city column to replace those dictionary codes, 1 and 2, with the names of the cities, LA and SF, finally giving this result that we have on the bottom of the screen, um, LA 2912 and SF 3753. And you can see that the advantage here of storing things in this way and doing the query in this fashion is that we never had to read anything out of the columns that weren't being used. So count and time were not read at all. Uh, there is no need to copy data from disk to memory or from memory to the CPU. We also did not need to use the data section of the artist column, uh, very valuable. Uh, we did not need to scan the index even of the artist column because we were able to use the dictionary and then do a random access into the index to get 
the uh, bitmap in question. Then in city and price, we did not need to read any rows that didn't match the filter. So we only read those first three rows. So this is really being very economical about what data we access in order to resolve a query um, and therefore minimizing the CPU and IO required to do a query. There's many, many other techniques that we use like this, uh, but this is an example of some of the most basic techniques. Next, I want to talk about locality. This actually builds on the prior techniques. It builds on the column orientation to make things even better. Let's say that we are doing a lot of filters on artist. Um, this is something that's a really common pattern in analytical applications. It's common to have a specific column that you're almost always filtering on. Uh, it doesn't always happen, but it is very common. And when it does happen, we can take advantage of it. And the way we take advantage of it is by sorting data based on that column. So let's say we're going to sort the data based on the artist column. Um, what's going to happen here is that instead of all the artists being all jumbled up inside each segment, we're going to see that all the zeros are together, all the ones are together, and all the twos are together of the three artists. And every other column is sorted the same way as the artist column. Um, so we're actually resorting the entire data set based on the artist. When we do this, if we filter on artist, um, you know, let's say that we filter on artist number one. When we, with, the, with the unsorted data on the left, uh, we see that we actually have to read every block. Um, the data set is split up into four blocks here for this column. And we have to read every block because uh, there's a one in every block. Um, with the sorted data on the right, we only have to read two blocks because the first and the last block do not have any ones in them. This is really helpful. Um, this further minimizes the amount of I.O. we need and further minimizes the amount of CPU we need uh, for queries that involve filtering on um, artists. So here's an example um, using query profiling, a really powerful technique where we see exactly where CPU time is going. Uh, an example using query profiling to show why locality is so powerful. So I mentioned blocks in the previous slide, that, that example with four blocks. In Druid, we store data in blocks. Uh, in the segments. So each column is split up into blocks of a certain number of values. And we read one block at a time. And each block is individually LZ4 compressed. So uh, what we're seeing here is that um, this is a query profile where most of the time is being spent in this function LZ4 decompress safe. Uh, this is the LZ4 decompressor. And this means that we're actually spending most of our time um, reading and decompressing blocks. This actually counts both the time to read the block and uh, the time to decompress it. Um, and this is, uh, in this example, um, the data set that we're running the query on, we're doing a high concurrency query workload, uh, generally filtering on a specific column. This is an IoT data set, so we're, we're filtering on the uh, particular time series. Um, but we're not sorting by the time series. And what that does is it means that all the, the data for an individual time series is all jumbled up, and so we're spending all this time reading blocks. On the next slide, uh, what I've done is um, we've rerun the test, uh, and in this version of the test, we have sorted the data by the time series, by the name of the time series. Um, and what this does is now instead of spending 90% of the profile on LZ4 decompression, you can see we're spending a much smaller percentage. And you can't see it in the profile, but um, we did measure this to be eight times lower CPU time, which is really powerful. And this shows why it's so powerful and so important to ensure that your data is uh, sorted in, in the right way to achieve the right locality. Uh, because this 8x difference in CPU time, 8x difference in IO as well, uh, is an extremely powerful thing. Another important technique in level zero is deferring computations. So the key insight here is the data size generally decreases in the later stages of the query. So imagine you're doing a query that does a filter followed by a group by. That filter is going to throw away some rows, and that group by is going to generally reduce the size of the data set. So the idea here is you want to move computations as late as possible. So here's an example. Uh, let's say we're doing this query. So we're um, grouping by the lowercase of a user. So take the user, convert this to lowercase. Um, and then we're counting the number of records for that user from uh, a traffic table. And then we're ordering by the count descending. So this is uh, the top users by number of uh, hits in a traffic table. 
So in this case, we're grouping by lower of user and selecting lower of user. So we're grouping on an expression, which requires computing the expression during the aggregation step. Uh, this example took six seconds to run. Now, one transformation that, that you can do uh, is instead of grouping by the lower case of the user, you can just group by the user. This defers the computation until after grouping. It's not done automatically because results are not the same if the function might map two inputs to the same output. So let's say your users, you could have two users that um, are different in case, but have the same lower case representation. Uh, in that case, um, these two queries return different results. But let's say you know that won't happen. Let's say you know that users are unique in a case insensitive way, and you just want to lowercase them for display. In this case, you can group by the user and then select the lowercase version uh, for display, but use the, the column directly for grouping. Um, in this case, the query runs eight times faster. Uh, it runs eight times faster because that expression is being deferred uh, until later in the query. I don't have a query profile of this query, but if you were to look at one, you would see that the version that groups on lower of user and selects lower of user, the one on the earlier slide, you would see it spends a lot of time computing that lowercase function. This is one reason why looking at query profiles is so powerful. It tells you exactly where CPU time is being spent and helps you reduce that CPU time. So next, let's move on to level one, scaling. Talking about how we scale out these individual servers into a cluster and issues we may run into along the way. So with scaling, we have two goals. The first is we want scaling to be lightweight. We want performance of distributed queries to be similar to local queries single on a single server. The idea is that when we're going from one server to two, so let's say maybe you're splitting up a single server, you're splitting up a 64 core machine into a 32 core machine. When we go from one server to two, uh, we don't want performance to be very different. The second is we want to scale linearly. So we want 200 servers to handle two times as much load as 100 servers if they're all the same kind of server. So what are the impediments to that? One of the main things that can go wrong with lightweight scaling that can make scaling much heavier than it needs to be is having a lot of data movement. So the performance degradation from one to two servers can be high. You could actually have heavyweight scaling if data movement is high. So there's many techniques to reduce data movement between servers during a query. And I'll talk about a few. Uh, one is sketches. So sketches, this means uh, ways of doing approximation using much less data transfer than the exact solution. So examples are hyperlog log and data sketches. These sketches are useful for count distinct, medians, quantiles, approximate joins, that kind of thing. Another is another uh, kind of approximation. There's a little bit of a theme here. Um, approximate top ends are useful for top end style queries, especially on columns with billions plus of uh, unique values. Uh, another technique that's not an approximation um, is to distribute joinable tables to all servers in advance of a join. So this is, speeds up a join. Um, one reason that joins are famously resource intensive in distributed systems is because of all the data movement that is required. But if we can distribute those joinable tables ahead of time, then there's actually no data movement required to do a join, uh, which makes them uh, just as inexpensive as doing a join on a single server. This makes the broadcast part of a broadcast join free and is a very powerful technique. Next, I want to talk about uh, impediments to linear scaling. And the biggest one there is the number of servers involved in each query. Now, I want to talk about why this matters. It matters because uh, of the variance in performance between servers, which can just be down to random chance. So imagine a situation where each query on each server has a 0.1% random chance of running slower than normal. So with one server, that's no big deal. Most queries are very fast and the overall throughput is very good. Only 0.1% of queries are running slower than normal. But with 50 servers, each individual query has a 5% chance of experiencing at least one slow server because it's got a 0.1% random chance per server. And that really, uh, it adds up. The chance that no server is slow, the chance that they're all gonna be fast um, is not 99.9%, .9%, it's only 95%. And then with 500 servers, it gets even worse. There's a 40% chance uh, that uh, at least one server is gonna be slow. The overall throughput there is significantly reduced because 40% of queries are getting hit by a slow server. Uh, 
So what can we do about this? Uh, recall that in level zero, we took advantage of the fact that many uh, use cases involve filtering on certain columns. Uh, these are things like time, user ID, etc. In level zero, we use that to sort the data by those columns we're gonna filter on, thereby improving locality. Here in level one, we're gonna use it for partitioning. We're gonna partition the data set with those columns. Now the idea is that when we partition data set with those columns, let's say we have a thousand segments in the data source. Uh, each, if we partition by time, then each day is only gonna appear in a relatively small number of segments. Each day of data will not appear in all thousand segments. It might appear in, you know, let's say five or six segments. Or if we partition by user ID, same thing for user ID. What happens here is each query uses a subset of segments instead of all segments, which minimizes the number of servers that need to be involved because the number of segments is low. Another approach you can do here is speculative requests. The idea here is that you send the same request to two servers, uh, and whichever one returns first, you use that one and then cancel the other one. The idea is that if you have one slow server and one fast server, you, and you don't know which one is which, you send it to both and you take the fast one. This increases total load in the cluster because you're essentially doubling the, the number of requests being made, but it does reduce variance. Uh, we actually have not implemented this technique in Druid, although it is a technique that is used in other distributed systems. Okay, now on to level two, heterogeneous workloads. Uh, so in level zero, we talked about minimizing the amount of CPU and I.O. required for an individual query so we can pack more queries into the same unit of time. Uh, in level one, we talked about scaling from a single server to a whole cluster without introducing new bottlenecks. And now in level two, we'll talk about when you have a whole cluster, uh, how do you run different workloads on that cluster uh, without them interfering with each other. So the, the question here is what do you do if your workload is not uniform? Maybe you're mixing high concurrency app driven work with low concurrency, but computationally expensive reports, ex exports, and ad hoc queries. Uh, the problem here is how do you avoid affecting application driven work, which uh, in most cases that app driven work is the work you really want to be very high performance. So there's a couple of techniques we can use. Um, the, uh, it's all about resource management. Uh, there's a couple kinds of resources that we have. Uh, I, I like to think of resources in terms of releasable resources and non-releasable resources. So a releasable resource is a resource that can be acquired and given up repeatedly while a query is running. Uh, an example here is time on CPU. So a query can take some CPU time and then it can give up the CPU and then it can grab the CPU again and then give it up again. It can do this repeatedly. In Druid, uh, any resources that are releasable are shared according to a query priority. So every query has a priority. It can be assigned by the user. It can be assigned automatically uh, by based on administrator policy. Um, there's various ways of assigning it, but each query does have a query priority. And uh, higher priority queries get these re shareable, um, releasable resources um, before lower priority queries, and they get to preempt lower priority queries. Now with non-releasable resources, the situation is trickier. Uh, the example here, or an analogy here, is, is a car on a freeway. So space on a freeway is non-releasable. A car will take up space continuously until it leaves the freeway. It can't pop up in the air and then pop back down. It must take up that space uh, once it enters, and it can only give up that space once it leaves. So the idea here uh, is to reserve some resources for higher priority work. Uh, going back to that freeway analogy, uh, some freeways have a carpool lane or a high occupancy vehicle lane that is reserved for vehicles with uh, one or two passengers in them in addition to the driver. The idea is that we want to encourage those kinds of vehicles, they're higher priority, uh, and so we reserve some space for them to ensure that they have better service. Uh, we can apply the same idea to databases. So in Druid, resources are reserved using query lanes. This is a, evoking that, that carpooling concept, similar to the carpooling on the freeway. The idea here is that there's certain kinds of resources like um, uh, certain kinds of buffers, certain kinds of space and thread pools, certain kinds of uh, scratch space on disk that are not releasable and must be reserved when the query starts and must be uh, retained by the query while it runs. 
Um, and those kinds of resources, uh, we have some set aside reserved for high priority queries. So they cannot be starved by low priority queries. In Druid, we can also use server tiers for the strongest isolation. Uh, server tiers, the idea here is that you actually have a separate pool of servers dedicated to handling certain kinds of queries. Um, and you, some people have a dedicated high priority uh, pool of servers that all their high priority queries go to, uh, or some consider that their default set of servers and they have a dedicated low priority set of queries or low priority set of servers that the low priority um, queries go to. These kinds of techniques uh, guarantee resource availability for high priority queries, but they can reduce overall efficiency. And so whenever possible, it's best, um, it's, it's, it's better for uh, more kinds of resources to be shareable. And so we always endeavor to make as many kinds of resources shareable as possible in Druid. Okay, finally, uh, you can try this at home. Uh, of course, this is ApacheCon, Druid is open source software. Uh, stay in touch with us. You can check out the project website at druid.apache.org. You can follow Druid on Twitter at druid.io is our handle. And also join the community. Uh, we're very active on Slack, GitHub, and the Apache mailing list. Go to druid.apache.org community. Thank you, and I hope to see you there. Bye-bye.